I had to have rotator cuff surgery right. about three weeks ago, and it has really knocked me for a loop. Mm. And uh, I think um, so many people are going through changes, life changes right now that are very profound. And it sure has radicalized me about Medicare for all, I'll tell you. Oh, I so bet. What, where would I be if I didn't have medical insurance with what I'm going through? Can you kind of explain your evolution on that yeah. issue? I was very proud of my health care plan because it had, it, I called it the whole health plan. And it had a lot of concentration, not only on treating sickness, but on uh, creating health. As I said on the debate stage, we need to ask ourselves, why do we have so much more chronic illness than they do um, in uh, European countries, for instance? And that has to do with our food policies. It has to do with our chemical policies. And also because of the uh, over-influence of big pharmaceutical companies on our actual medic uh, medical education. Most most uh, doctors who graduated from medical school in the United States only took a year, half a year of, um, wow. uh, of of education in nutrition, for wow. instance. If you visit somebody at the hospital, you'll notice what crappy food they yeah, are fed. Yeah. So one of the things in my health care plan was if you go to the doctor, it is mandated. You are guaranteed to be informed about any non-surgical or non-pharmaceutical uh, uh, treatments of that same condition, which have proven to be uh, close, if not completely uh, equally efficacious. Those were the kinds of things we had. And I felt that by having a, um, a sliding scale, a sliding scale that we could just slide into Medicaid, you know, that it, that it would be fine and we didn't need specifically Medicare for all. Once this pandemic hit, though, I mean, that just went out the window for me. I just don't see how we can think about it any other way. So the pandemic just took me over. But then mm -hmm. my having surgery myself, I, I just, uh, it, it's like I said, taken me to a place of... Yeah. I mean, you see these costs and everything like what interacting with the healthcare system, like you're saying, is a great way to become radicalized about the healthcare system. Well, when you're sick, the last thing you need is all that red tape and paperwork. And I mean, I think that Americans, the level of chronic tension and anxiety mm -hmm. economically, people don't know what will happen if they get sick. People don't know what will happen if their kids get sick. How am I going to send my kids to college? Uh, how am I ever going to get out of these college loans? No one can soar under those conditions. Mm -hmm. No one can soar. And that's why we have so many deaths by despair. We don't need just incremental change. Something is so fundamentally off course. Yeah, yeah I, you're right. What else has the, the pandemic revealed to you? Like the way it's shifted your view on Medicare for all? Has it changed any other? Um... Well, look at the bailout. The bailout, yeah. first of all, the bailout is no different than the bailout of 2008, thank you very much, which was under Obama, right. which is basically a corporate bailout. So to me, the template was already there. And what they're doing with this is just really 2008 on steroids. Uh, the idea that we are not giving direct cash relief. Remember, we already had 90 million people. 93 million people were living on, uh, near poverty even before this happened. We had 40% of Americans who could not absorb an unexpected $400 expenditure. Mm. Now look what we have. Now, if you take a country like England, what they've done is to give people 80% of their salaries. That's the way you save your economy. You give direct cash relief. <laughs> yeah. So, like people like Ro Khanna and Tim Ryan have suggested. The fact that we had a $1,200 one-time payment that Mnuchin had the audacity to call bridge liquidity. <laughs> How dare he? How dare he? How dare he? $1,200 bridge liquidity. And now they're on vacation. Yeah. Are we millions, these evictions. It's, it is a level of let them eat cake. Yeah. That has never in history not led not led to revolutionary fervor. Right. You sort of foment these conditions. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, especially that, you know, the UI benefits were basically what was keeping the economy afloat, Other, you know, uh, uh, ahead of these basically just the Fed printing money and buying stocks. Like, it actually helps the economy when people have money yes, to spend. The money they spend it. <laughs> yeah. That's why things like, um, you know, 
universal health care. That's why things like uh, free education at colleges and universities, that's why the eradication of these college loans, all it's going to do is free people up to be happy at work, to start right. businesses, to be good employees, to be creative, to create wealth and spend money, which mm -hmm. really goes to show you it's not just a resistance to sharing money. It's a resistance to sharing power mm -hmm. because when people are living above um, survival, which is basically where we've placed millions and millions and millions of Americans, they kind of do what they want and create what they <laughs> want and make things happen. <laughs> yeah, think scares, um, even if it's only unconscious, that 1% of corporatocracy mentality than um, the sharing of cash. It's more than cash. It's power. That's really yeah. the fear here. And even uh, that is an unconscious, you know, I'm a Course in Miracles student, so I always see things through the filter of the sort of psycho-spiritual. Even that is a subconscious fear uh, that people will do to them what they feel subconsciously they deserve. 